Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn, to, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to start in verse 14. I uh, didn't think I was going to do a series, but this is really turning into a series as I am writing. Uh, so I'm going to call it Practical Living Sermons. Okay, Practical Living Sermons. Uh, last week we spoke in Romans chapter 7 of how our flesh is still with us and it wants to rise up against us. Uh, but Paul admonished us that we have victory in Jesus Christ. We have the blood of Jesus Christ uh, covering our sin. Uh, we have forgiveness from Jesus Christ. And bottom line, folks, we don't have to sin. Okay, It's a choice. God has always given a man a choice back to Adam and Eve. Today I want to talk to you about our Christian conduct our Christian co conduct. If you have a bulletin and following along with us, you may want to write uh, some of these notes down. Number one, our attitude towards others. Our attitude towards others. Number two, our attitude towards worship. Our attitude towards worship, which is very, very important. And number three, our attitude towards sanctification. Our attitude towards sanctification. And folks, you have to understand, uh, when we speak of our Christian conduct, we're talking about our Christian behavior. Our Christian behavior is how we talk and our actions. Uh, the goal of every Christian should be to talk and act like Jesus. He should be our role model, our guide, and the person we emulate. Every day of our lives, people are listening to what we say and looking at how we behave. I know nobody's perfect, but we should strive perfection in our Christian walk. We should treat others the way Jesus treated others. We should be ministers of encouragement to the lost and the saved world. The Apostle Paul writes about how important our attitudes are in relations to others and to worship and to be a Christian. Uh, may we all be, uh, may we be all God wants us to be in a fallen world. And let me say this as we launch out, folks, attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. And you can tell when somebody's got a bad attitude. All right? You can look at their countenance. You can see what they say or hear what they say. You can see their actions. So you can't hide a bad attitude. You may try to, okay? But I'm just telling you, attitude is everything. Let's start in Verse 14, our attitude towards others. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for all. So we see these, uh, you know, this this advice Paul was writing. Uh, to the church in Thessalonica, and he was just trying to talk to them about Christian maturity and how important our attitude is. Obvious, obviously, some people in the church were not acting like Christians. And folks, we, and, and again, I know we're not perfect, but we should uh, seek perfection. We should uh, try our best uh, to, to act like Jesus Christ and Think like he does and, and react uh, the way he would react to others. So let's look at these. The first thing is warn those who are unruly. And the unruly are those, sometimes they're new believers and they just don't know, okay? They hadn't been in church all their lives. They don't know all of God's commandments. And the deal here is in our warning, you know, what we say, our voice tone is so important. It's just like when you ask somebody, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm fine. Well, you know they're not fine by their voice tone. And even in warning people, folks, we need to do it in kindness. We don't need to judge them. We simply need to point out, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing that. That's a warning. Everything we do as Christians, listen to me, the Bible says we need to do in love. Jesus loved the unlovable. 
He hung out with people that were scorned. He had even a disciple in his group that was seriously breaking the laws of God. That he was stealing, okay, and even sold Jesus out. But he treated the unruly like he would any of the others. And we remember the time uh, when he washed the disciples' feet. He didn't treat Judas any different than the rest. So it says, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted. And folks, uh, when it says comfort, uh, we we associate that with death, but the faint-hearted are those that may not have a strong faith. They may have had something come up in their life and they dropped out of church or or they, they, you know, some people even see them as they've quit, they've thrown in the towel. Well, folks, those are the people that need to be encouraged, encouraged in the faith. We need to warn the unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak. And the weak is not talking about physical strength here. It can be, and we need to pray for those people, but the weak, again, is those uh, that are not uh, mature in the faith. We need to bring them along along beside us. We need to mentor them. We need to help them with their faith. We need to follow up with phone calls. We need to make visits to those who are weak. And here's the one, and boy, we have a hard time with this. Be patient with all. Be patient. Folks, we don't even like the word patient. I visit people in the hospital, and I'm just telling you, you know, you can just tell they don't want to be there. It's not like you want to be there, but folks, you're there for a reason. You're there to get better. And I've heard everything on, I'll push that button and an hour later, somebody find the king. Well, I got news for you folks. Your attitude ain't going to change that. It's not going to change that. You need to be kind. You need to be uh, sweet. You need to understand that Uh, You know, you don't know how many patients that nurse has. You don't know when the doctor's going to come. You don't know these things, all right? We need to exercise patient with all. And folks, all means lost people and saved people, okay? Some people I know, you know, when when they see you come and your count, when you see them come and your countenance changes, and in your mind you go, oh, here we go, here we go. And folks, I'm telling you, you're already messing up with that kind of attitude, folks. Jesus did these things, and we could look in the Gospels and see that he was patient with all. I think of the Apostle Peter. All right, Peter, what did he do? He spoke first, and then, and then he did actions. Some of his actions, I mean, he's the one grabbing the sword and cutting off ears. Okay, that's not the way to do it, folks. Jesus was patient with these 12 disciples, and we need to be patient with others. Now, verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Folks, this is a struggle for some folks, okay? The the world says if someone has wronged you, you have the right to get even. You have the right uh, to to bring your own judgment on that person. You have the right to talk about that person. Folks, but if you look in Matthew chapter 5, several times, I believe there were six times in Matthew 5, he said, the world says this, but I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. And folks, that's what he's talking about here. It's not our job to get even. Folks, here's the deal. I promise you God will do a better job than you will. You have to turn these things over to God. Hold your finger there and go to Ephesians 4 with me. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, we're talking about wanting to get even. Verse 25, therefore put away lying. (laughs) Well, Folks, our Christian conduct, we need to tell the truth. We don't need to lie about anything. There's no need to lie. But people lie all the time. Christians lie, folks. And we should not do that. 
Let each, of, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one with another. Okay? You should be truthful in all your dealings. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, I can get mad, I can get angry. No, you get angry at sin, not the sinner. You want to get angry at somebody, get angry at the devil, folks. You can get mad at him. You can say this, I want to punch him in the nose. All right? Get angry at sin, but not at people. And here's a key, do not let the sun go down, uh, go down on your wrath nor give place to the devil. If you go to bed mad and you're seething, I'm telling you that's going to go over into the next day. I tell couples, when I counsel couples in marriage, take care of it. Even if you have to stay up till midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, you take care of this issue. Don't go to bed angry at anyone. Verse 28, let him who stole still no longer, but let him labor, working with his hand what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. And folks, again, this is talking about giving people the benefit of the doubt. I realize we have a food bank, and I realize not everyone that comes is honest in what they're saying. But we don't have the time or the resources to, to check every story out. I would rather give out food to people than, than not give food to people that really need it. So what we're saying is don't prejudge folks. Don't just look at somebody and, and do that. Don't do that. And I understand we need to work. We need to work and, and do that those things. But he's talking about he who has need. Okay, the need. We need to meet the needs of others. Now here it is. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. Woo! That'll hurt you. It does me. There are times that I say something and as soon as it comes out of my mouth, I'm thinking, woo, I shouldn't have said that. Okay? Now, I don't cuss. Don't take me wrong here. I'm not a cusser, okay? I'm simply saying I may be teasing, but I can tell by the reaction that was not a good thing to say. And folks, we need to correct that quickly. We need to say, oh, I I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Please forgive me. And it says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification that it may impart grace from the hearers. What do people want, folks? They just want grace. They just want you to be nice to them. Well, folks, we got grace from God. God gives us grace, and we need to turn around and give grace to others. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, clam, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. There it is. You don't get even. You don't write. Folks, some people say, I just need to write them a letter. And tell. Folks, I'm just telling you, you, you are, that's not a good thing. They have proof, all right, of what you say. All right, you need to pray over things and talk to people face to face. I don't like, you know, I mean, I do talk on the phone, but folks, if there is any issue, I want that person in the room with me, just me and them and us settling things, taking care of business so that I can apologize if I need to to that person. It says, here's the ver verse I wanted to get to, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Tender-hearted, folks. That's, that's kindness. That's being nice. Forgiving one another. We need to be quick to forgive. The disciples and Jesus was talking about forgiveness one day, and I don't know who piped up, and he just simply said, well, how many times do I have to forgive them? And Jesus said, 70 times 7. And you know what some of us do? Every time someone wrongs us, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we're marking them down. Well, I'll be glad when they can get to 490 so I can give them a piece of my mind. Well, folks, if you're like me, you need to save your mind, okay? Don't say something that you're going to regret. Don't have a fit of anger. And folks, it's like a fire 
of fire does danger. It, it destroys a relationships. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgaveth you. So our attitude towards others is so, so important. Also, number two, our attitude towards worship. Our attitudes towards worship. William Temple penned this definition of true worship. True worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open up the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. Folks, we didn't come here just to hang out with one another. Okay, we didn't just come here to see what each other has on or what kind of Bibles they're carrying or how good they sing or how good they look. That's not why we came here, folks. We have come to this place to worship our Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, it is the most, Sunday is the most important day of the week. It's where we come in and we read the Word of God and we sing the Word of God and our hearts are stirred, our souls are moved. And it's a time when we get closer to God. But folks, I'm telling you, your attitude when you walk in makes a huge difference. I'll never forget, I was over in Alma, and our house was right by the Family Life Center. And I went down the stairs to get to the church across the, the parking lot. And one day, I looked up, and, and they were parking. They came early and were parking there, and some man and woman just, yap, yap. They were just yapping and, you know, pointing at each other and doing all this thing. And then they got out of the car. And I said, how are you? Oh, we're doing great today. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you just lied, okay? You just told a lie. Folks, they were barking at one another. And folks, we have to learn, we have to check those attitudes at the door. Do not bring them in here, okay? Yes, you can bring burdens. But I'm telling you, what we need to do is focus. Focus on our Lord and Savior. Focus on God Almighty. Focus on the Word of God. This is what these verses are speaking of. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. Folks, you can find something to be happy about. You can be happy. You might as well a laugh as to cry about things. And I know there's a place, a time, to, a, a time to laugh and a time to mourn. I understand that. But I'm just saying rejoicing is, uh, you know, being in the song service, not just being here, but a participant. Not just sitting on the sidelines. But I'm just telling you, folks, you need to get happy. We need to get happy feet and happy hands. Okay. I mean, there's times my foot is going while I'm, I'm, you know, praising the Lord and I'm going like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Rejoice always. Folks, I want to be around positive people. I want to be around people that find the good in others. I want to be around people that has enthusiasm and that's excited to be at church and that is excited about their walk with the Lord. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That doesn't mean when you're going down the road, bow your head and close your eyes. Matter of fact, yesterday I was coming up to church to do a little work, and I'm telling you, stopped at the light. Someone stopped at the light down there at McDonald's, and I look up, and he takes off, and he's going like this. Just going like this. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to slow down. He was right beside me. I just slowed down and got behind him because I didn't want him hitting me. Okay? That's not what it means, folks. It means be in a season of prayer. Be quick to pray. Don't pray when things get terrible and there's no way out and you're in a jam. Don't pray just then. Pray without ceasing. This is part of worship. I won't do this, but you in your mind do this. How many of you here, don't raise your hand, do not raise your hand. Do not. How many here 
prayed for this service before you came. Don't raise your hand in your mind. How many prayed for this service last night? How many prayed when they got out of bed this morning? Folks, I'm telling you, prayer changes lives. Prayer changes me. An attitude of prayer is what I need to come to worship with. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. We don't like that word everything in this sentence. I should give thanks when I get bad news from a doctor. Well, folks, you're alive. You're able to get up. Folks, do you realize there are people that couldn't even get out of bed today? Couldn't even get out of bed. Someone is meeting their needs. They can't even feed themselves. Give thanks in everything. Look at this. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Hold your finger there and go to Psalm 100. Psalm 100. Man, I love this psalm. We need to practice this psalm, folks. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye lands. You can shout to the Lord. By the way, Steve, I love that song, Shout to the Lord. Okay, bring it on, bring it on sometime. Serve the Lord with gladness. Smile. Tell your face you're smiling. All right? Some of you, I'm not sure you even have teeth. I haven't seen your teeth. Okay? You come in. Through the whole song, you can even sing, and I can't see your teeth. <laughs> Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Folks, I'm not making this stuff up. This is God. This is how important worship is. Know that he, know that the Lord, he is God. Let me sum this up. He is God and worthy of our worship. He is worthy. He is more than worthy. It is He who has made us and not we ourselves. We are His people in the sheep of His pasture. He made us just like He wanted you to be. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. He is our shepherd. Nothing happens in our life that He doesn't know about. Nothing is impossible for God. Why would that not make you happy? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. We're coming up on thanksgiving. Be content. Be satisfied. Look at what you have and, and not at what you don't have. Into his courts with praise. Praise his music. Praise his song. Praise his clapping. Praise his raising your hand. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. Oh, he's good, folks. His mercy is everlasting. Folks, his grace, grace is giving me what I don't deserve. His mercy, folks, his mercy is not giving me what I do deserve. Folks, I do not deserve heaven. I don't. I don't. His mercy forgives sin. Thank God for that. And look at this, and his truth endures to all generations. I'm telling you, they could take these Bibles, and they do this, folks, in third world countries. If they find a Bible, they burn them in the city square. But I'm telling you, they can't take the Word of God from my heart. They can't do it. That's why it's so important to read and spend time with God and spend time with God. This is public worship. This is a time of celebration. This is a time uh, to where we listen for God's voice in Scripture. Then verse 19 says, Do not quench the Spirit. I'm just telling you folks, it's like some folks, you know, you're telling something that's all good. Oh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that happened. It's like getting a, a bucket of water on a fired up Christian or, or even a fire and just pfft, and watching that happen. You ever, you ever throw a lot of water on a fire? Two things happen. There's a lot of smoke, and those ashes go everywhere. Folks, don't quench the Spirit. Folks, we quench the Spirit sometimes in our attitude. In our attitude. 
we need to have the attitude of Jesus Christ at all times. Do not despise prophecies. Prophecies. And again, we're not talking about predicting the future here. We're not talking about Old Testament here. We're talking about the Word of God. When you hear the Word of God, and it is true, we need to ask ourselves, how are we doing? How are we doing with these things? Don't shoot the messenger, folks. I'm reading the Word of God to you. Do not despise prophecy and test all things. Test all things. Folks, there's two tests that we can do. Two tests that we can do. One is, is my spirit, does my spirit bear witness with what this person is saying? Does my spirit, the Holy Spirit, bear witness with this? The other test is the Word of God. Is what he's saying line up with the Word of God? Hold your finger there and go to 1 John 4 real quick. 1 John 4, I want you to see this. 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Folks, I'm telling you, the spirit of the Antichrist is everywhere right now. It's everywhere. You need to recognize false teachers. You need to recognize false doctrine. It's everywhere. But test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Folks, I'm telling you, it is here. You don't need to be listening to folks that do not line up with the Word of God. I'm telling you, I can turn a person on and, and listen to that person for less than five minutes and know whether I need to listen to that or not. We have to do the test, folks. Those two things are so, so important. Hold fast to what is good. And here's my life verse, one of my life verses. Abstain from every form of evil. Abstain means avoid. Okay, we hold fast to what is good. We need the goodness of God in our lives. We need to be good to others. We need to find good in others and abstain from every form of evil. Folks, we, we have to get away from sin. We've got to get away from it. We, we don't need to compromise. We don't need to make excuses for. Okay, avoid all appearances of evil. Folks, it's everywhere. It's on the internet. It's on our television. It's on our phones. These influences. I'm telling you, these the, the, the communication, some of these things that you can just, those pop-up things, I'm telling you, it's devil sent. If you will look at those things, games, parents know what, you, what games your kids are playing. They can be negative, negative, negative influences on uh, your, your child's spirit. Know these things. So we see our attitude towards others, our attitudes towards worship, and then our attitudes towards sanctification. Look at verse 23. Sanctification. What sanctification? Folks, that's the process you are in now as a Christian. The process. God is trying to make you more like Jesus. More like Jesus. You need to be a positive event, uh, 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 testimony. You need to be a positive example in this negative world. We do. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Nobody's arrived spiritually, folks. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things, Paul, and the reasons he is speaking this, because if you look back in verse 13, it talks about uh, the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord. And some of the Christians would just, here's what they were thinking. They think the Lord's coming anyway, so what does it matter? Okay, we're all going to die. We're all leaving this place, so I'll just do what I want to do. And Paul is saying, you can't have that kind of attitude. That is not the attitude 
that you need to have as a Christian. You need to be ready. You need to be anticipating that coming. Folks, we're all going to stand before God. Every one of us. And it's talking about our spirit, our soul, and our body. Every bit of us. And I understand he that began, began a good work is, is going to do that. Yes, I understand that. He's still working on me. But folks, we need to remember these things. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful and will also do it. Get the word I can't out of your vocabulary. I can't. Folks, my Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I don't care what addiction you have. You can overcome it with Jesus Christ our Lord. You can overcome it with the power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing you can't do without, with, with Jesus Christ. Then Paul says, brethren, pray for us. I thank God for everyone that prays for me. And people tell me many times, preacher, I pray for you every day. Thank you, and please, please keep it up. Pray for us. Greet all brethren with a holy kiss. <laughs> now you need to understand the timetable this was written and the location of these folks. Okay, in that setting, it was good. I'll never forget when I first came to Alma. First Baptist, we were at this prayer meeting, and this older gentleman was heading towards me. I'd never met him at all. And he said, are you Mike Franklin? I said, yes, you are. And he looked at me, and he kissed me on my right cheek and turned around and kissed me. On. I'd never had a man kiss me before, okay? I'm just telling you. And Bob Shelton was sitting there, and he had the biggest grin on his face because he knew that it was a godly, elderly man. And that's the way, hey, if you're elderly like that, you can get away with that, all right? Be careful who you kiss is what I'm trying to say. I'm used to putting my hand out and shaking a person's hand. And even now, you, you got to figure out what they are going to do now. Sometimes I put my hand out, and they got the fist. Oh, we're going to fist bump. That'll work. All right? But just, you know, there's nothing wrong. If it's your culture, if that's what you want to do, but be careful. It's simply saying, greet one another. Verse 27, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I'll never forget Cliff Palmer who led our first revival here when we were in the old sanctuary. And uh, he was just a godly man. Didn't know him, but he'd come highly recommended. And I'll never forget what he said. And I wrote it down, and I say it often. Here's what he said. You cannot offend a spirit-filled Christian. Now chew on that a minute. You cannot offend a spirit-filled Christian. But yet, folks, sometimes we are easily offended by folks. We are looking for the bad or the mistake. Folks, we all may make mistakes. There is no one perfect in this building. And I'm just telling you, folks, our Christian conduct needs to be one like Jesus Christ. When they use the word blameless up here, that is not sinless perfection, but blameless is quick to ask for forgiveness and quick to give forgiveness to others. Blameless is quick to ask for forgiveness and quick to forgive others. One last scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. Just turn back at just one page. Finally, my brethren, we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Folks, He's just summing it up right there. What, what should I do? What should my attitude be to please God? I'm not here to please man. I mean, I hope you like me. I wish you liked me. And, I'm, you know, that'd be nice if you liked me. But if you don't, then it's not my problem, folks. I get my instructions from the Lord. My series comes from the Lord. Everything comes from the Lord. For you know what commandments we gave to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now look at this. Where everybody's always looking for the will of God. Brother Mike, what's the will of God? How can I know the will of God? Well, he tells you right here. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. To be more like Jesus today than you were a month ago. Or six months ago. Or two years ago. Sanctification is that process of making you more like Jesus. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Folks, what is he saying? Don't fall into the world's trap. The world will tell you many things are okay. The world will tell you everybody's doing it. The world will tell you, well, nobody's looking or nobody cares. Well, folks, I got news for you. God sees everything you do. And let me take it one more step. God can read your mind. You can say something out loud and be thinking something in your head, and you just broke the commandment, thou shalt not lie. We need to be Christ-like in everything we do. And folks, as we close, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Has there ever been a time that you've made Jesus Lord of your life and you've asked for the forgiveness of sins? If you haven't done that, I, I, I promise you it would be the best decision you ever make in your life. Would you bow your heads? Bow your heads at this time. I'm telling you, this is a sermon that every one of us could rededicate our lives to Christ on. But you just do what God tells you to do. I want to ask you this before I pray. Are you right with God? Are you right with God today? Are you right with your family today? Are you right with your fellow man today? If not, I challenge you to get right. Just get right. You can do it right there. You don't have to come forward. Our prayer altars are always open. Our ministers are always here if you want to talk to us. But would you just get right with God today? Father, you know our hearts, you know our minds. And God, I pray that we would understand how important our Christian conduct is. God, I pray that you would just help us to understand if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, I pray, I pray that today, Lord, if there's Christians here that need to rededicate their life and publicly do it, I pray that they would do that. If there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would come forward on a profession of faith. And Lord, maybe somebody's been saved and they haven't been baptized. God, I pray that they would uh, come forward and present themselves as a candidate for baptism. Lord, we know you love us, and we know uh, even, even in, in joining the church, God, there may be some folks here that they've been coming here, and they know our doctrine, and they know how we line up with the Word of God. And today is the day. God, I pray that they would do that. God, we love you. This is your invitation. We have come to worship. The invitation is part of worship. And God, we give it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?